Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about can the incursion bring Putin down? Okay, we have his warlords and his oligarchs. And are they threatening his power for any reason or for all the reasons we know? Our co-host for the show is Tim Apicella. Our esteemed guest for the show is Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar. Welcome to the show, Tim and Gene. Thank, Thank you. you. So let's let's start with uh, you, Gene. What's the situation in Russia with the incursion? This is a remarkable thing, but it's hard to understand why Zelensky did that and how far he can get with it. Can you comment? Well, there's been a lot of speculation about that because it was a surprise. Uh, we believe it was a total surprise to the United States as well. Um, Putin does not. He thinks the United States was in on this and has has uh, sprung this on him. And what it has done is crossed some red lines of Russia by going over the border into Russia itself, forcing evacuations, mass evacuations, expanding the zone of control of the Ukrainian army in an area that the Russians had controlled and were shooting um, missiles and drones from. Now, it is as much of a psychological uh, surprise and blow, according to the pundits who have been commenting on this, as anything else. And there's been a range of speculation about its impact on Putin. In terms of mi the military situation, it really hasn't changed that much, except if they are able to hold that territory, which is questionable, they then can move forward the missiles they already have received from the West, which are relatively short range, and they can reach farther into Russia because uh, Europe and the United States have been very cautious about giving long range missiles to Ukraine. They really don't want uh, a a, any kind of nuclear response. But Zelensky seems to be saying to Russia, you know, um, I don't really fear that there's going to be a nuclear response. We're just going to go in there and show you what we can do. And there are other strategic reasons, for example, deflecting some of Russia's massive forces from the south and the east over to this cursed region in the north. But it's also somewhat to um secure the zone around its second city of Kharkiv, which is an important center in Ukraine. It has been threatened terribly by the Russians because it's close to that northern border. So they're, they have more control over the um, thrusts that Russia has been making toward Kharkiv. So there is a military objective there, I think. However, as to how Putin is going to respond to this, he, he generally takes a while to kind of get his ducks lined up, and then he pounces. What he has done so far is, in a very angry fashion, send massive missiles and drones over civilian areas in Kyiv and other parts, and is striking heavily on Ukrainian infrastructure. Yeah, that raises the question, Tim, of whether whether Putin can do so much damage, including mm, damage to the uh, energy infrastructure. He seems to be uh, attacking uh, energy generation uh, infrastructure. Um, that that he can neutralize and negate the benefits uh, that um, Ukraine has achieved in the Kursk region. Um, what do you think? And did and did Zelensky anticipate that? Um, sure, they Zelensky anticipated because uh, everyone knows that Putin can't stand any hint of uh, failure, and so he's going to strike out uh, very harshly. I, I'm not convinced that Ukraine wants to retain this area. Um, if he really wanted to retain it from a military value, uh, he's certainly not showing. What you would normally do, and that is, you would uh, create a wide swath of landmines around, you know, your encampments. Uh, he's certainly not doing that. You would bring in your anti-anti um, air defense uh, apparatus, and I don't think he's necessarily doing that. So, 
it's a question of what he really is up to. Um, you know, the obvious reason why I think the incursion took place is not to necessarily make deeper strikes into Russia and rattle their cage. I, I think it's a bargaining chip at the negotiation table. You know, I'll give this up if you give that up. Um, but, you know, I don't think it's time for negotiations. I don't think anyone's interested in negotiations. I know um, Modi from India is, is uh, making over, overtures about trying to, you know, insert himself as some kind of a negotiator for a, a ceasefire and end or <clears throat> settlement of the war. Um, but that's, that's not really making much headway, I don't think. Uh, so it's a question of, you know, why, why Zelensky did this. I, I think it's a huge psychological victory. And, but he's going to pay the price on the attacks of the infrastructure within Ukraine borders. Yeah, one thing that comes to mind, uh, you know, hearing your discussion on this is that um, why why did uh, Putin uh, attack in Ukraine rather than counterattack uh, in in the Kurds the Kursk area? Uh, you would think he would do that. Now I've heard it said that he didn't do that because the Ukrainians are right there in the villages with the people, and if he does a carpet bombing uh, initiative all over that area, he's going to kill his own people. Not that he cares much about his own people, but uh, that would backfire on him. And I guess the question that comes to my mind is, you know, you say that mm, Zelensky has to pull back at some point and surely every, things that go up must come down, right? <laughs> but the question is, he's been there for two weeks or more, maybe going on three, um, and he hasn't pulled back. He's He's got 500 miles under his control now. Um, what does this mean in terms of a plan to pull back. And I agree with you that what he has said is this is all an effort uh, to move into peace negotiations. This is part of a plan to achieve peace. He said that he's been quoted in a lot of media about that. Um, are these things connected? The fact that he hasn't left, that he keeps on pushing ahead, uh, the fact that Putin really doesn't know what to do to stop him, um, and the fact that he, he uh, Zelensky, wants to achieve peace, and that's the, the bottom line of the incursion. What are your thoughts? Jay, I think foremost in Zelensky's mind is the morale of his own people. They have been in stalemate. They have been taking heavy casualties. Uh, they have been, in their minds, not fully supported by their allies, and they are facing a relentless enemy uh, who has access to most of their borders and can do anything that they, they please. So I think to one extent, he wanted to show what the army could do when it wasn't bound down in trench warfare that didn't move appreciably in the Donbass, which they fought over since 2014. And so I think that's foremost. He also wanted to capture Russian prisoners of war, uh, military prisoners. They're not out so much to kill them as to capture them because they want a hostage ex a prisoner exchange. They want their prisoners back. They want their manpower. They want to show their people that they can get their prisoners back. So I think it's morale builder, first and foremost. There are other advantages to it, of course. Um, I heard a report that they, at one point, could have attacked Putin himself. They could have taken Putin out, but they called uh, the United States and uh, it, was, it was said, no, we don't wanna do that. It's not really smart to take out the head of your enemy because then who are you gonna talk to and who are you gonna depend on uh, for delivering the goods when you're ne negotiating? I've also heard that Zelensky says, he has a peace proposal that he's run by Biden, and he will reveal that in due time when he's ready to, and that he would like to make peace with Russia. But there is nothing in that peace proposal I can imagine that will give up territory. And so that, that's the one thing that would make a peace negotiations acceptable is giving up territory. So 
who knows what is in the mind of Zelensky? What is in the mind of Putin is he's been outflanked once again. He's been humiliated in the eyes of his own people. Because as Diane Francis, writing in Substack, who is a scholar with the Atlantic Council, has said, um, you know, the people in Kursk, in that territory, will speak to their relatives outside of that territory and ask for safe harbor because they can't go back to their homes. And pretty soon, everybody in the major Russian part of Russia will know. And it's it's also interesting to contemplate what Russia is. Russia basically is an empire. It's a huge piece of territory, but, but a lot of that territory uh, is occupied by people who aren't Russian, who are minorities, who feel enthralled to uh, the regime in Moscow and, and the people in St. Petersburg. It's the historic main Russian people who are quasi-European that run the show. And they're the ones that Putin has been protecting. He hasn't been conscripting soldiers from the Russian people. He's been conscripting soldiers from far afield in Siberia and in the South and Dagestan and places like that. And those are the people that are paying the piper and they're not happy. So when the Russians themselves are impacted, when their soldiers are impacted, and uh, it comes that close to home, the psychological blow is major. I think that one of Zelensky's big reasons for this incursion uh, was to excite the media because the media hasn't been excited about this war. It's been getting stale. It's become a war of attrition. And uh, I don't think he was getting the kind of response and support he hoped for not only from the U.S., but from you know, Western Europe. And so when you do something unusual like this, when you take some risks, uh, when you do something newsworthy, may I say, all of a sudden the media starts paying attention to you again. Uh, and I think that had to be part of his strategy. It has to be part of his strategy now. He wants the world to focus on this. He wants the world to know that he's alive and kicking and his army is alive and kicking. And they're serious. But the, you know, the other thing about it is um, this uh, Di Diane Francis article really does uh, offer the possibility that the oligarchs uh, will, will force Putin um, to stop or they will organize a coup against Putin uh, in order to have this war stop. Um, and it's hard to say what Putin will do because he, he's fully capable of um, killing them all. Uh, as 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 we know. So, Tim, I, I wonder what you think is going to happen here. Will we have the pressure from the oligarchs, as Diane Francis suggested? Will we have a coup? Will we have a revolution? Um, how is it going to go? Well, that's a heck of a prediction you're asking me to make. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I Putin has lost a lot of money for these oligarchs. Their yachts have been confiscated. Their bank accounts have been, you know, either compromised, frozen, whatever. Um, and they're not making money like they used to. Although, you know, Russian oil sales are, are still going quite well, they're not able to really leave the borders and, and enjoy life in Europe and the beaches of the Mediterranean. That's a hardship for oligarchs. They don't like that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so they're not happy about this invasion of Ukraine. It wasn't thought out. And certainly, um, it's gone on a lot longer than Putin ever estimated, and that looks bad for everyone. So, is there going to be a revolution? I, I don't think so. Um, I think what we saw if, as far as the first form of revolution was the brain trust and the economic uh, assets of Russia escape immediately uh, when, when Putin started to say, I'm going to conscript my fellow, uh, my fellow citizens. Uh, the smart money got out of Russia. Uh, if you're an oligarch still in Russia, I'm sure you're nervous every every morning you wake up knowing, did I say something that will put me in the gulag? Or worse yet, uh, a bullet behind the ear. So um, I think Putin, like Stalin, rules with an iron fist. And I think he spreads intimidation far and wide. 
And you can't even say the word war in Russia about the Ukraine war. Uh, if you do say war, then you are picked up and you are jailed. Um, that tells me that you have a dictator that is quite effective in fear and intimidation. And I think that will filter all the way up to the oligarchs, not, um, not embolden them to, to make a move on Putin. Yeah, but you know, Tim, this is, this is a dynamic. Uh, I was telling you about um, this uh, oligarch who did say something adverse to Putin some years ago, and Putin jailed him for 10 years. He won't be doing that again, but he left Russia right. soon to get out of jail. And now he's speaking to the media, the media. Okay, so we have his report uh, about exactly who Putin is and what Putin does. And one of the interesting things he said in this uh, YouTube interview is that Putin used to be interested in money like the rest of the oligarchs, but, but that's changed. He's not interested in money. Now he's on a mission and his mission is to you know expand Russia. And um, the interviewer asked him, well, is he going to expand to Poland and, and the Baltics? And he said, he said it in Russian, um, and there was a, a translator there. He said, of course, he's got plans. He said as much. You have seen it in the media, in the Russian media, the approved media. You've seen his plans to attack Poland um, and to attack the Baltics in general. So that ought to give some concern to Germany and Poland, of course, um, and and the oligarchs are aware of that, and they're talking about it, and they're they're um, you know echoing it, and and um, it's a it's it's news. Furthermore, you have these these uh, these news anchors who have left, you know, part of that um, part of that escape pro process that we've seen. The revolution you call the first revolution, where they all left. Well, they're not just sitting on their hands; they are talking to the media. They are writing and speaking on television and the like, and they are telling you the problems that Putin has. So you know, we can't sitting here with uh, you know our talk show. We can't really fully understand how this um, seeps into the Russian thought process, the people. Um, but certainly the possibility exists that all this anti-Putin, anti-propaganda that's coming in from the outside, from all these people, is reaching at least somebody. And then you have the incursion, which actually you know, affirms that there is a problem, affirms that he is not invincible. Um, so you know, when you shake it and bake it, Gene, do we, do we really, does Putin really have a problem? Or is... Um, you know, Diane Francis, um, you know, making this up. Well, I'm sure she isn't making it up. I'm sure she has seen or heard things from inside Russia that gives her some hope that Putin is vulnerable. Uh, he is not vulnerable to direct attack from Ukraine. We know that because the Allies won't stand for that. I don't think Putin is vulnerable to being. Uh, assassinated by Ukraine. Uh, that, that's a bridge too far. Um, I think Ukraine wants to humiliate him and weaken him and his position within the major Russian sphere and particularly his elite classes because these are people who are sociopathic and corrupt, many of them, and uh, very self-oriented. However, I don't think I'm not as hopeful as she is, that these people themselves can come together, merge their private armies, stage a coup, and push the Russian military behind them. Uh, Prigozhin was pretty strong. He gave a try, and he suffered for it. And everybody in Russia knows that. Then Putin went on a huge campaign before he was reelected to show how wonderful he was. And he got out and campaigned just like he had some sort of um, competition, which he didn't, but he did it mainly to boost morale in Russia. What we're seeing basically are two countries that are fighting a war of attrition that both are getting tired of, I think. And who's gonna blink first? So I think this was a very creative way for Ukraine to try to make Russia blink. That's what I think it amounts to. Uh, I think your point is well taken. He's uh, KGB, he's FSB, he has all of the 
tools uh, of the state, in, including the internet tools, which are formidable. Um, and he is he probably is just as aware of every single person who's speaking against him. Uh, he is tracking this very carefully with all the people available to him. So if there was a plot against him, I think he'd find out. And if he found out, uh, he knows what to do with them, you know, the verb progotion. I guess my question is, uh, what what is happening? Was Zelensky mm, successful in raising the uh, the consciousness of Western Europe, uh, specifically Germany, maybe Sweden, a new member of NATO, uh, France, Italy? Um, did he achieve that? And have they changed their policy and their supply of money and weapons because of it? And what about the U.S.? This is a hard question, Tim, but I, I really, I must say, I enjoy asking you hard questions. That's that's just me. Uh, what about the U.S.? Has has his move, has Zelensky's move, uh, had any effect on American policy? Uh, Gene mentioned that the American State Department told him not to assassinate Putin. Um, so, query, what are they telling him? What should they tell him? Um, we're in a different chapter. I hope you'll agree with me. And the question is, how does that affect um, the moves that Western Europe makes and the moves that the U.S. makes, particularly in view, okay, of the election? Okay, well, I'm going to go to um, point number one, and that is I've never seen a more charismatic leader who's being, uh, uh, you know, attacked by a force 20 times greater. I mean, this is the mouse that roared. And this was an example of how a leader can travel abroad and gain the sympathies of Europe, the United States, and countries around the world. I've never seen uh, the public relations aspect of uh, an embattled leader uh, so well presented on stage, the world stage. And it's really a phenomenon. And yes, this, this war has you know, been winding down, grinding on. And uh, you're right. Uh, I think that his sense of public relations is so acute that he recognizes that the media and the media's attention is waning. And if that wanes, so goes support of money and resources from his European uh, nations and, and from the United States. So he's keeping that front and center as best he can. And uh, certainly during the stalemate of the winter, that didn't help matters. He was receiving a great amount of criticism that, um, you know, Russia was making gains and, and, and Ukraine was failing to stop those gains. Uh, so I, I, I agree with Gene that this, you know, was a huge psychological boost to Ukrainians. They're worn down. They're fatigued. But uh, there's nothing like, uh, in, you know, enhancing the spirit of fight. And, and, you know, temporary, even though small victories, to regenerate um, the ability for them to want to fight on. And I, I think ultimately the United States role is going to have to more or less convince Zelensky that you're going to give up territory in order to get a settlement here. And as untrustworthy as Putin is, uh, if this thing is going to get settled out, and I've said on previous programs about this topic, I, I don't think this may look any different than what the borders were established uh, in 2014. Uh, somehow, I just think we go to those borders before the incursion, and that's where things settle out. And then you have almost a North Korea, South Korea kind of environment where you have incredible arms on both sides of this demarcation, and that's where things settle out, that no, no country is going to invade because the loss will be too great because of the military buildup. Um, as far as how Europe continues, uh, their interest is well well entrenched. If Ukraine goes, so goes the non-NATO uh, countries. And, and then you now have a bigger problem. So I, I think EU sticks in there. I think the United States sticks in there as long as uh, Harris and the Walsh team is uh, elected. If it's a Trump team, I think that uh, that court fades rapidly. And um, oh, Vlad, in his friendship with Trump, um, wins the day. Now we had a show about um, the visit that uh, Narendra Modi paid not only to Moscow, but a few weeks later uh, to Kiev. And uh, it, it was clear that, um, that India 
needs to have its pro-Russian relationship continue because they they buy oil and gas at reduced rates. They uh, sell weapons to uh, to Putin, and so there are, you know there's all kinds of factors in the world that that would tend to continue to support him or at least support him in dragging his his heels on a negotiation. But um, <clears throat> Gene, your your thoughts about these very points? One other report I got. And maybe it was Diana Francis who gave me this report. I don't recall. There was a pipeline that was to go through Mongolia from China to Southeast Asia to supply oil, um, well, through Mongolia to China to supply oil to China from Russia. And that was a big uh, part of the Russian and uh, Chinese uh, alliance prior to this war. China has been very unhappy about this war because it has uh, weakened Russia. The pipeline now, uh, Mongolia is not allowing the pipeline through Mongolia anymore. So this was a big showpiece in the uh, whole strategy of Putin against the Atlantic world and in favor of what I called his Eurasian strategy, which is Russian domination of the Eurasian continent. And he was playing China to get that too. And he's using oil to play with everybody. So I think there are other initiatives he has been taking in Europe. Uh, we've talked about arsons that have been committed that KGB or FSB operatives who are being monitored by Interpol and other European security agencies can't work freely in Europe anymore. So they pay local criminals to commit arsons and interdict facilities where the arms that are being sent and the material that is being sent to Ukraine have to pass through. But lately, we have seen attacks on people we, to destabilize societies. And one of the questions you ask is, what is Germany, its attitude vis-a-vis -vis Zelensky right now? Because Germany was softening its support of Ukraine. In Eastern Germany, there is a rising AFD leader. That's the alternative for Deutschland or alternative for Germany, which is an extreme right wing, really proto fascist movement that's gaining ground in Eastern Germany and Thuringia. And this uh, new leader has just met with Olaf Scholz, the social democratic um, head of Germany. And he is modifying his position, Stoltz is, on immigration, because all of these right-wing groups are very anti-immigration, and Germany has taken in over a million refugees from the Islamic world. So it is having an impact on Germany. Germany is starting to really worry about the right-wing um, threat, and it, but it is becoming stronger in its support of Ukraine, and I think it was impressed by what Ukraine did. That said, there was a, an attack on a, uh, a school in Germany, in Solingen, and uh, children were killed with knives. That happened in England. And then there was a synagogue fire uh, after uh, a man tried to attack a synagogue in Lamont, France, in Southern France. All of these three initiatives to me, in a short amount of time, say that there is maybe some FSB attempt to hire local people to commit these crimes and attacks. They're not normal. <laughs> They're much more normal for the United States than they are for Europe. Because what happened in the UK was after this attack killed children, um, there were riots all over the UK, right-wing riots. And they were put down, but Nevertheless, it destabilized the society and really frightened the regime in the UK. And I, I think Putin would like, this is one way he strikes back at the West and tries to weaken it. Yeah, we, uh, we posted uh, an article about the speech that the new prime minister made about the situation in the UK. And he was not optimistic. Um, he's, he's got all this divisiveness and contention. Um, by so many people protesting and counter-protesting, 
I, I think they're becoming non-functional and maybe that has some effect on their ability and their will uh, to support Ukraine. So yes, uh, if all these things seem to work in Putin's favor and P Putin knows how to do it, he's an old fashioned intelligence guy and he knows how to do it. So Tim, I mean, what's your level of optimism about this? Uh, you, you say, well, the only solution and other people say this too, the only solution, this is what Modi says, Narendra Modi says the only solution to this war is a negotiated peace. But, you know, fact is that Putin hasn't shown any interest in a negotiated peace. It, it would be really remarkable if one day he changed his mind and, and said, OK, 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 um, I'm in favor of a negotiated peace. That would surprise me. Would it surprise you? How optimistic are you? Well, you know, uh, we go back to sanctions and the open sieve of those countries that get to buy uh, oil from Russia and other certain goods the lack of enforcement of effective sanctions, uh, if that somehow by miracle were to be uh, ratcheted down, you may see a different position from Putin. But as long as he gets his revenue from oil sales and all these other uh, items, um, yeah, he has time to spend on this. Uh, other than soldiers coming back in body bags and the words getting out that the losses are catastrophic, I mean, uh, I think dead is over 100,000. I'm not sure on that oh, number. Two, 200, 200. 200,000. Now, remember, Vietnam for the United States was 58,700. We're looking at 200,000 in the course of less than two years. Um, internal strife is something that Putin should be concerned about, not to mention making his oligarchs a little bit less happy and uh, not as rich as they want to be. Um, Again, I, I think he's trying to get out and save face. That's, that is paramount for Putin. I've got to be able to save face. Remember, Putin thinks he's the reincarnation, I think, of uh, Peter the Great. And uh, would Peter the Great be humiliated as he is right now? I don't think so. So there's, there's got to be a strategy that allows Putin to save face, yet making a negotiation to end the hostilities and the war. So, Gene, we, we know what Trump would do. He would give it away on day one. Well, that's really sad and outrageous. But what about uh, Kamala Harris? What, what should she do? I mean, in, in, the, in the vernacular of foreign policy, the word mess sounds appropriate. It's an old word used in foreign policy. Um, Europe is a mess. And the Middle East is a mess, too, by the way. Um, so what should the United States do? Assuming she wins, how can she clean this up? What, what kind of initiative should she undertake to bring it back to rationality? That's also a hard question, but I'm giving, I'm giving Tim a break on it. Well, she's had the experience since February 2022 of seeing how a Biden doctrine has worked with respect to Ukraine, which is good because Mistakes are always going to be made when there's a novel situation going on. And then ideally you would learn from those mistakes and you would become a, a bit more adept at uh, handling the situation over time. So that's good. But I've also read that she has her own foreign policy team about whom I know next to nothing and <laughs> I haven't read anything about them. I think Nicholas Burns is the only one mentioned. He's the head of our CIA right now. And he's an old hand in the Middle East, too, as well. Um, he's a very experienced, sharp guy. And he's now in, being involved in the Gaza negotiations. But he's the only one I've really heard of. I think what we're looking at is a policy, a return to realism and pragmatism in uh, foreign relations. There was this great... Uh, bipartisan um, uh, general strategy put in place after World War II. It was a strategy of containment based on George Kennan's idea of containing uh, the great powers that were uh, hostile to us uh, because we had nuclear bombs. Uh, but our nuclear agreements are in tatters right now. We have buildups in the nuclear um, facilities of, of uh, China and Russia and 
the United States, which has to follow suit, of course. So, Don't forget Iran. Well, yes, Iran, but they're not a nuclear power quite yet. I'm looking at the big three here. And so Harris, one of the first things her team is going to have to confront is the status of the nuclear buildups and not just nuclear, but also conventional Navy buildups by China and Russia vis-a-vis the United States and bringing us up to speed and preparing us for uh, a modern warfare, which we're learning about it a lot in Ukraine, which is a fortunate thing. But we have to prepare. We have to be prepared because we don't have the agreements in place that would kick in if there was any sudden thrust toward Taiwan or the Baltics or, God forbid, Israel on the part of uh, several hostile uh, entities. So uh, we're, we need a lot to, uh, to do a lot more, and I would be hopeful that her team would do that. I am absolutely certain that Trump would not put a team in place that could play at the same level as uh, our adversaries. Well, um, we're almost out of time, so I'm not going to ask for final comments, but I would like to pose one question to Tim. Um, You know, Gene talks about the team that Kamala Harris would have. But, you know, the country is divided um, on isolationism versus involvement. And I wonder how far she can and should go in advising, you know, the country on her plan. Um, and her inclinations with this team, as far as Ukraine is concerned. Can she talk about it, or will it hurt her more than help her? I think she already has talked about it in her her speeches, and certainly at the uh, the convention. And that is the, the, you know, the portrayal that not supporting Ukraine will adversely affect the United States sooner or later, as did World War II in its isolationism back then. And I, I think somewhere in that discussion that she has with the nation is to remind them that elections matter and that uh, there's a clear distinction between the Trump proposed Trump administration and the Harris Waltz administration and support of Ukraine is paramount in, in, in her platform. And I, I think most Americans agree that it is important to protect Ukraine. Um, they may not realize the, you know, the historical lessons of, of um, a Chamberlain approach to Germany, but uh, they will understand that sooner or later resources and a lot of resources, potentially troops, will have to be dedicated towards this conflict in Ukraine. So uh, I think even, even, you know, Americans that aren't well steeped in history and have a basic uh, limitation of their understanding, um, I think they even get it. So uh, Harris should continue on her very strong messaging uh, in speeches to come and in interviews to come that uh, protection of Ukraine is in the best interest of the United States. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Gene. Great discussion. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha.